Hello everyone, welcome back to Fox4G 2021. Today is Thursday and this is the East Huma Hackathon. And now we will be having Johannes Kroger uh, with visualizing trajectories in 3D. Uh, thank you, Johannes, and uh, inside yours. Thank you. Let me move this over here. Perfect. Right, um, I'm going to show you how to build a map like this using QGIS tools. Um, I made this before, it was from a hike in Switzerland, it was pretty nice. And I thought, how could I visualize this in 3D, how to show other people where I walked around. And this was a nice, a nice approach. Before I start, um, in the abstract I said, I would also look at the QGIS native 3D, 3D support. Um, I won't, so if that's what, why you're here for, sorry. I'm going to use a, a plugin, QGIS to 3JS. The native 3D stuff is awesome in QGIS, but not quite there yet. Maybe next year I will check again. For me, it crashed and I thought, no, let's not do that um, for this conference. Right, so uh, wrong focus. Who am I? Um, Johannes Kröger, I'm in Hamburg, Germany for Wear Group um, since March of this year. I'm a QGIS um, Python developer, consultant, um, and trainer. And yeah, I'm in cartography. I like OSM, open data, and so on. So it's a pleasure to be on FOS4G for the first time, actually, as a presenter. Wear Group is a company in Germany. We are yeah, doing that kind of stuff. So FOSGIS, developing and consulting and, and trainings. Um, we are hiring. Um, if you like MapBender, for example, it's one of our flagship products. Uh, come talk to me or Astrid or Jörg, for example. That much for adv uh, advertisements and the introduction. Let's dive right into what I want to show you. Uh, what, I, what I want to show you. My talk is kind of a showcase. It's a plugin that someone else built. It's Minoru Akagi. I think he's from Japan. It's also not new. It's been in development for eight years already. But I just like it so much. I love it so much that I wanted to show it and inspire you to also yeah, give it a try, um, use it someday, and play around with it. QJS to 3JS, as it says in the title, it converts QJS stuff to something else, to 3JS. It's a um, yeah, web development 3D framework. And basically, you can, you can take it and turn your map canvas from QGIS into a 3D scene on the web, interactive with zooming and panning and rotating and so on. You find this project, of course, on GitHub. There's the source code. There's also a great documentation, including tutorials, examples, and so on, on Read the Docs. And of course, you can install it using the normal QGIS um, plugin installer. So what can this do? Um, this plugin makes it easy to take your QGIS map and build a 3D scene. For that, for example, you can use a raster file as the elevation model to get 3D terrain. Right? A raster file can be geodata for heights of the land around that place. You could use another image or a layer or even the whole canvas image to put that on top as kind of a texture on this um, 3D terrain. And you can take your vector data and also introduce this into a 3D scene. You could say this should be a box, this should be a, a certain model, and where should it be in space, and so on and so forth. Then you click two buttons and you have something you can upload on a web server, just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and you're ready to show this to your friends. As I said, I did this for a hiking track, also using geotagged photos, and it would just walk you, to, walk you through some of the decisions and some of the features and show you how you can do that. For the start, you need a map in QGIS, right? If, the, if QGIS has no data in it, you can't 3 d it, right? There's nothing. So first, let's find some data. When I walked around on this uh, mountain, mountain ridge, I had my, my uh, phone with me. It was tracking my position every like five seconds or so. And I could export that as a GPX track. You might know that from Garmin devices, for example, from GPS devices. And QGIS, thanks to GDAL, supports this format as well. I can just drag it into the map and say, oh, load this, load, load this data, please, as a multi-line string or as points. In this case, I decided to load it as a line string. And then I have a blank map with a red line in this case, somewhere on Earth, wherever I was. I also took a lot of photos because the mountainside was so nice. I mean, in Switzerland, it's mountains, and you can't walk around and just not care about the environment. It was really beautiful. And in QJS, 
already for a couple of versions, actually. There's a processing tool that lets you import photos, and it can look at the metadata of these photos and check if there's um, tags that say this photo was taken at this longitude and latitude, maybe at a certain uh, alti altitude as well. Um, and this is, what, this is what I used to import these photos into QGIS. What you get is points, and each point then has attributes, for example, the path to the photo that was loaded for the altitude, so the Z coordinate, how high this was about, uh, above the ellipsoid. You get the direction in which the photo was taken, so the compass direction, and, and that I was pointing my camera, and also the 2D coordinates and the timestamp as well. And here I show it simply using a raster image in the QGIS canvas. So we have photos with locations um, somewhere on the track that I walked on. But we want to know where this actually is and how the terrain was there. So I also added elevation data from uh, SFGM, uh, Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF. And you can see already, right, the dark parts are low terrain, the bright parts are higher, so the mountain here um, is clearly visible. If you hill shade it, of course, you see that Switzerland has some nice hills, or let's say it's mountains, right? It's pretty high. And there's my track. So I walked up the mountain over here, then I walked along the ridge of the mountain, and then I walked down again. But still, it's just the view from above, right? We are in QGIS on the canvas. We don't see that much. For context, I also added nice satellite imagery, Im imagery from the friends at UX in Austria. They provide a nice cloudless WMTS server. And this is what I also added on top of this. So we have all our data. We have some kind of reference data. We have a 3D, well, not, not 3D yet, but we have elevation data. We have a texture we can project on top of it, so nice green hills. And we have some traje trajectory, and we have some points as well, so some vector data we can add to this. Let's put that into the 3D world. In the plugin, you can first decide if you want, for example, to exaggerate your vertical axis a bit, which makes things look more impressive. And you can, for example, choose a fixed extent. Otherwise, it would always follow the map canvas extent and might be confusing to you. Once you did that, you can simply select a layer on the left side and say this layer, in this case, the EM layer is my SRTM data. This should be my terrain. And you get a 3D representation of it. I made it gray just to show you how it looks like on a yeah, model, um, model level. We'll also zoom in a bit. If I zoom in and I toggle it to wireframe mode, uh, don't get flashbacks to Ivan Sanchez's uh, triangle talk yesterday. Um, these are also triangles, but not red and not lime. Um, this shows you the representation of the terrain in 3D. Right For each of these small triangles, the plugin checks what's the elevation data below this triangle and adjust the vertices accordingly. So the smaller these triangles would be, the higher would be the resolution of your DEM and the more detail would be served. But this also means more triangles, it um, needs more performance, it might get laggy, it may stutter on your computer, and also the file size in the end might be much bigger than before. So you have to some, find some kind of middle ground between detail and um, yeah, not so much detail. What also plays into this, of course, is the texture itself. Um, in this case, you see it's kind of blurry. I hope you can see it. And that's the default. You could increase the texture resolution if your data allows that. You don't see much of a difference, but it's a bit sharper, right? You could also make it, of course, less sharp. Um, and these two things together decide really how fast your scene will be in the browser in the end, if you can rotate it fluently or not, and if it's like 100 megabytes or 5 megabytes. So find some kind of middle ground. It's always different for different um, data sets. So you are kind of on your own there, but play around with it. And remember that the texture also provides a lot of structural detail. I chose some kind of middle ground, looks like this. That's pretty fancy in my opinion. Of course, we are zoomed out, but you can see the mountain range and also all the nice green hills or the green mountains. It's just the base, right? Our 3D terrain and a texture on top. So let's add the 3D objects as well, our vector objects. And I will start with the points. You can see the line as well. Ignore that for now. But let's look at some um, options how we can represent points in the 3D scene. 
I showed earlier that the photos actually also had an altitude information. So not just on 2D at which latitude and longitude they're located, but also at which height, of course, WGS84 and so on is not very accurate uh, from GNSS, um, even less accurate, but there is some kind of Z coordinate. So you also see them here placed on top of the mountain, right there in a 3D position. Right here, I just choose the type sphere. So some kind of a spherical buffer around these points is created. And in this case, it's displayed in red. So that's one option you could use to display or to, to visualize your points. You could also, for example, use cones, or you could use cylinders. You could use boxes. And here I choose a different height just to show you you can do that. Right, you could do, uh, make a bar chart on top of mountains if you want. You can pick, for example, a disk. It's just a flat disk. And here you can see that some of, some of the options that you can choose. You see here um, at the top the Z coordinate. It says absolute and Z value. That means we take the coordinate from the point, the Z coordinate, and display it there, but also add 123 meters to it. So it's a bit above the original value. You can also use an expression for the color, for example. Otherwise, it would use the style from the feature. You can change the radius, and you can also use functions in these expressions. So for the dip angle, right, how it is dipped in space, I just used a random value here. You can really do a lot of stuff if you want. You can use planes. Here it shows a, an attribute, direction, or altitude for the length and the width, just to show that. You can use icons, right, this layer head links to the original photos. And like in QGIS raster images, you can also um, use it here as a path to a photo that will be, uh, to, a, to an image that will be displayed in 3D space. Always facing the camera, you can always see them from up front. It uh, might be the perfect thing for your use case. But I wanted some kind of uh, something more fancy. I wanted some kind of models. And that's also something you can do. This plugin supports Collada and GLTF models, so you can specify the path to a model file. These ugly cameras are like two minutes in Blender. I made that just to show you that it's it's possible. And you can also rotate these in space. In this case, I rotated them in the same direction as the direction of the photo that was taken. So the camera points in the same direction as the photo that was taken there. This is kind of fancy because you can also use way more detailed um, models. Here I used some um, rubber ducks and also some light sources, actually. And if you would rotate this and look at this in more detail, you would see that there's, there's also photorealistic materials rendered. So anything that 3JS can do, you can use in QGIS to 3JS as well. You could also theoretically use animated models if you are a programmer. It's very amazing. But yeah, for me, I use the cameras. That's enough. Let's also quickly look at the lines. Um, the line itself is by default just displayed by a one pixel line in space. There's no solidity, no 3D um, uh, body to it. It's just a one pixel line displayed where it is. You can see here that I checked something else. I choose a different mode for the Z coordinate. I set relative to the EM layer and 25 meters above that. So in this case, the line doesn't use its own Z coordinates, but it actually checks what's beneath me, what's under me, what's the Z value of the terrain here. And let's place myself 25 meters above that. So it goes up the mountain, along the mountain, and down the mountain, following the terrain below it. For lines as well, you can use different styles. You can use, for example, cones again. This would place some kind of cone on each vertex of the line, which might be perfect if you want to visualize some kind of flow or something. You could use boxes. I made these a bit transparent to, to show you. You can use opacity. You can also use a so-called wall. It's just a 2D plane oriented in space. So it stands um, on the line. You could use that, for example, also to create a profile. Right? You could move this above the terrain and say, um, put my elevation line um, on top of that, which also looks quite amazing. But for me, I used the object type pipe. It's basically like elongated spheres, I guess. So it's kind of roundish, looks a bit like a worm or like a rope. Um, I kind of like it. It's perfect for displaying a line um, with a thick style on the terrain. It's not that beautiful, but it's OK for me as a 
programming nerd, right? It's, 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 it's nice. Cool, so we have a line and the models. You can also add more data to this. By default, you just you can click into the scene, and if you click on an object, you get the name of the layer and the coordinate at which you clicked in the 3D scene. But you can also take a box and say, please include the attributes. This means that all the attributes of the original file will also be available in this 3D scene. So in this case, I clicked on the camera on the left, and you can see in the small pop-up on the left, there's the photo, the path of the photo, and the coordinates again. So later on, you could, using JavaScript, build your own code that then yeah, does something else with these attributes, maybe. Or you can use it to inspect your data, of course. If you include the attributes, you can also create some yeah, rudimentary labeling. Um, here, I just said, please use the time field as a label and put it above my model. You can see a very, uh, very small, like 10, 51. I started my, I made my first photo and then it got later in the day. Um, yeah, these labels are not that beautiful. I will change them later, but just to show you, you can include some kind of labels. Cool. So what else can we do? We can also add decorations. Um, some people say every map needs a north arrow. I say very few maps need a north arrow, but in 3D, it can be very useful because north is also, right, it's turning around in space. And here you can see at the very left bottom, there's some kind of small arrow. This is always pointing in the direction of north. Here I also added some other decorations. I added a header, right, a, a title of the map in the top, and at the bottom some kind of loom ipsum text and a, a link to the sources. And you can see that's just HTML. In the end, you just, just get an HTML file. So also here you can use CSS to style it and to put a box around it, put a shadow around it if you want. That's all, we have our scene. We have our elevation, we have a texture on top of it. It looks quite nice. We have some visual visualization for the points at which I took the photos, and we have some kind of visualization for the trajectory itself. We have attributes included, we have nice decorations and so on. So we are happy with it. Let's put it on the internet. And then you click two buttons and say, please export it, and you get a nice file, and that's it. What comes out of it? is, as I said, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and something more. In this case, it's, it's about four megabytes. You can easily do projects that are much bigger. Um, in this case, it was quite, man quite manageable. And it's just yeah, 20 files, maybe. Um, so also no um, biggie to put it on the server. You could run it locally if you use the right settings, or you upload it to a server, and then you can open it in your browser. And you will also get a link in a moment. Right, this is now Firefox, and I could do the same like I did in the um, plugin itself. I didn't show it yet, right? I could zoom around, I can move my camera, I can rotate it, and so on. But before I show you the demos, some more enhancements that I want to show you. Because this is all just, just, uh, yeah, in Anführungszeichen, would say in German, right? If we are a bit sarcastic, it's just HTML, JavaScript, and, and CSS. So. It's not hard. No, actually, of course, it's hard, but it is just that. You can edit all the stuff that you want in the end. Um, for example, you can change the label style. The labels are just HTML elements, and you can access their CSS class and say, oh, no, I want them bigger. I want them in a different font. I want a nice shadow around them, for example. So here I used a, a font with serifs, a bookman something, instead of the small one that was there before. You can also hack around in the JavaScript, for example, here. It's not beautiful, but it works. I took out the, script, uh, the stuff that builds the attribute table and instead said, oh, no, I just want to see my photo. You know the link. You know the path to the photo. So just put in an image tag. And now I can click on the, on the cameras and see the photo that was taken there. And if you are a, a 3.js uh, fan, you can also use 3.js features. For example, you can use fog in your scene to make more distant things fade out in the distance, which looks very, very nice if you do it. So time for you to test it. Um, Yoshi, you can paste the link in the chat if you want. Of course, maybe wait once uh, a couple of seconds, because I'm right now in front of you in time. It's very weird if you think about it. Um, yeah, this is the 
an embedded iframe inside my presentation here. So you can see the interaction. I can fly around, I can click on something, and you see my photo over here. This link will be gone in a couple of days, but for now you can test it if you want. And one last thing, let me check the time. Yes, I should be finishing, sorry. Um, one last slide will be the mobile part. Um, you can also go on that site, and I will try to make a fast live demo here, because you can also export a mobile application. Uh, let's see if this works. So I have my tablet here. I have the scene open. I can zoom around, flip around, and so on. And I could also tick an augmented reality button. And now I can move my tablet around. And you can see not much uh, like this. Right, you can walk around around it. And I could also, if I was at the same place like this was actually taken, the same physical um, location like the scene, I could click on the navigation button and be inside my scene and look around, which is really quite amazing. Right, that's it. Um, I hope you had fun. I hope it inspired you to try this. Um, as I said, try it. We should um, find 600,000 downloads, I hope, uh, in, the future, in the future soon. It's just um, below that. Cr uh, try it, QJS to 3JS. And that's it for me. And I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, hello. Thank you for your talk, Johannes. It wasn't very interesting uh, now we have time for some questions let's see if we have we don't have any yet so please uh, send your question to the questions tab and i will try to show the rr stuff again let's see i now clicked inside oh no it doesn't work you can show now okay <laughs> you can try it um, it's quite fun Let's see. Well, I guess that if we don't have any questions, we can finish now. If you have, uh, or if you want to have some additional comments, you can uh, always ask me around. I'm still around for the conference. So if questions come later, just ping me and ask me. Sure, then we will do that. Thank you so much for your time, Johannes, and for your talk. And we will be seeing you around in Phosphogy. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.